Hi, I'm Chris Ralph, the professional prospector, and we're here to talk today about silver. Hey, silver is a very valuable metal, maybe not as valuable as gold, but plenty valuable in its own right. Now, have you ever wondered what does raw silver really look like? Or raw silver ore? You know, there's been a whole lot of uh, great silver producers that, well, they were initially ignored because the people didn't really know what silver and silver ore really looked like. And in fact, Virginia City here is one of those places. Now, I've brought you to Virginia City, and behind me is the great CNC shaft that went down to the amazing big bonanza here on the Comstock load. And I'm telling you that literally millions and millions of ounces of silver came out of the ground just behind me. You see, over here are some foundations. Those were the foundations for the hoisting works, for the head frame and the hoist that it went down, the shaft went down thousands of feet. And right behind it, uh, over there, is where the shaft was. And literally men went down there and they hauled out thousands of tons of ore. And like I say, literally hundreds and millions of ounces of silver. And hey, not a, not a small amount of gold either. A pretty significant amount of gold too came out of that shaft. But I want to talk to you about silver and silver ore. And today we're going to look at a whole bunch of examples. I'm going to talk about how silver ore forms and and we're going to talk about you know what it looks like and how to recognize it and if you want to have that skill of being able to recognize silver ore well stay tuned because like i say here in the comstock load at least originally it was a problem you see the miners were up the hill up there ways and they actually so a couple of miners dug into a spot on the hill where there was a little spring and they found there was some decent gold there and they had some water and they worked it but there was this nasty blue black stuff that kept getting in their way and they cursed it and threw it aside and but they were getting some decent gold out of it even though their gold was was real pale in color it it it, uh, it just didn't look the yellow of normal gold well Eventually, some smart guy figured out, hey, I should take that funny black, blue, black stuff and, and have it assayed, have it checked. Well, he did, and guess what he found out? That it was super rich silver ore. And so the Comstock Lode was born as a silver mine. And in fact, the reason that their gold was so pale in color was, well, the gold was alloyed with a lot of silver. So the Comstock became famous for its silver. So let's take a look right now at some examples of silver ore. We're going to start with what raw, natural silver looks like. So let's get started. So here we are, a piece of raw silver. This is native silver um, formed as metallic silver in the ground from Norway. Actually, the mine here is a very famous mine, famous for producing very unusual specimens like this. You can see how strange and, and abstract it looks, but this is how it naturally forms. It's not a piece of artwork. It's a, it's a piece of nature's artwork. Here's another one with the weird wires and tangles. Nobody bent this into some odd shape or fashioned it this way. This is exactly how it grew in nature. Yet another example of the weird wires bent and twisted by how this is literally crystals that are grown, uh, crystals of silver metal that are grown together into these uh, abstract and, and uh, fantastic shapes. Yet another example of that same sort of thing. Now, um, you'll see some of the specimens I've shown you are bright and white like fresh silver and others are brown and darker colored like this. It's actually a matter of tarnish. You could take this brownish specimen and if you put it in some sort of tarnish remover, uh, you would get bright white silver again. Because, you know, if you're in air that has any kind of sulfur in it, it, it over time, the uh, silver will tarnish. 
yet another specimen of metallic silver. All this silver comes from um, what they call secondary processes, meaning this is not the way the, the mineral originally formed, but by weathering and, uh, and the effects of water and that sort of thing, that's what produces most of this uh, metallic silver. It's, it's a secondary weathering process. Now, you might wonder, uh, you know, does silver ever occur in nuggets? Is it always just wires like this? Well, this is the silver dog. It was actually found by a metal detectorist in Arizona. It weighs almost 20 pounds, 20 pounds of silver. I bet that guy was excited when he uh, dug this out of the ground. That's a very interesting and odd specimen, but uh, that's how it formed in the ground. So, yes, silver does form in the form of nuggets. And, yes, they can be found with metal detectors like this one. And it doesn't have to be almost 20 pounds in size for your metal detector to see it. Actually, a metal detector would see pretty small pieces of, of native silver. But uh, silver, native silver nuggets, even though silver is much more common than gold, the actual silver nuggets are actually much rarer than gold. Gold naturally forms into a metallic type of thing, whereas silver more commonly is combined with other metals. And we're going to talk a lot about that as we go on in our video today. So here's a silver nugget found in the placer mines of Fairbanks, Alaska. Um, this looks more nuggety. Uh, it probably has been rolled around in the water, but you can see the gray, dark uh, corrosion surface. It would be, like I say, white metal underneath, but uh, it's spent time uh, in the ground, and so it's tarnished. And yet another uh, metallic silver nugget. Uh, this uh, type of uh, deposit, this type of nugget, it says silver after chlorargyrite. And this is a basically a silver mineral and uh, I, saw, I said it, it, the silver forms by a secondary process. Well, the chlorargyrite is also a secondary mineral and apparently it formed and then it was changed also through weathering to metallic silver. Here's another, also another specimen from Norway. Norway tends to produce a lot of these real spectacular uh, specimens. You can see this one, the wires are smaller, it's less fantastic in shape. And actually most native silver when it's found in the United States and elsewhere um, and in Norway too um, tends to form in things that look more like this than um, than like the fantastic amazing specimens that we just looked at a minute ago okay so you've just seen what natural raw native silver looks like and the weird and fantastic strange shapes that it tends to take when it forms. We've also talked a little bit about how it forms and stuff. Now we're going to take a look at a more common form of silver ore which is silver uh, in the form of sulfur minerals, the sulfides they call them, and in combination with other minerals like, or other metals like lead and copper and zinc and other things. Now I mentioned that most silver comes in the form of minerals, and this is a silver bearing mineral. This is not metallic silver, but it is a combination of silver and sulfur. So it's a silver sulfide. Um, known today as acanthite. And this is a, an unusual crystalline shape of it. It normally forms more sooty looking masses. In fact, a lot of different silver minerals tend to be black and sooty kind of looking. So here's an example of a more crystalline form of silver sulfide. Here is another mineral, um, another black silver mineral. Um, this is called polybasite because it's silver and then a number of other different metals combined together. That's where you get the poly part of it and the base is, is for base metals. So polybasite. So lots of different uh, base metals combined with silver to make uh, a rich mineral like this. Here's a 
Another black silver mineral, pargerite. Um, this is a uh, silver antimony sulfide. And uh, I guess the specimen was thought to be from Tonopah. But you can see the black silver minerals. Here's another specimen of the same mineral, pargerite. Uh, this is actually from the Comstock Lode up at Virginia City. And this mineral, if it hasn't been exposed to too much light, this has been exposed to too much light. It actually, over time, turns to this gray metallic kind of look. But as it comes out of the ground, it looks more like this. And that's why it's sometimes called ruby silver. This is a silver mineral. This is ruby silver. And you can see why it got its name. It's got that dark red color. And uh, this is another silver bearing mineral it's a very nice specimen with crystals of it not all the specimens are so nice with crystals another example of silver ore from ontario the ontario cobalt ontario area where they have uh, mines a lot of famous mines for silver and and they do produce uh, metallic silver in that area also but I mentioned that a lot of silver minerals have, a, in, in ore anyway, have a sooty black appearance. And you can see these black spots. I can tell you that if you were standing there in person and looking at this specimen, you would look at these little black spots and see that they had a kind of a sooty sort of a look to them. And indeed, this is a silver mineral. This black mineral is a silver mineral. Now, I do want to mention that not every black and sooty looking mineral is a rich silver ore. In fact, there are a number of uh, different kinds of ores, especially ores of manganese, which tend to be black and sooty looking too. So if it could be a silver ore, yes, the silver tends to be black and sooty, but there are other things, other minerals also that tend to be black and sooty. I've had people ask me that question in the past. You know, they showed me some manganese minerals. It's like, yeah, I'm sorry. I wish I could could tell you this was silver, but it's not. So anyway, this is silver ore. This is from the Comstock Lode, and it has that black sooty look to it. Here's another specimen. This is from central Nevada, from the Gilbert District, and it also is black and sooty looking, and it has a, a, a considerable amount of silver in this specimen more black and sort of sooty looking uh, specimens of silver this is from the comstock load but and i want to um, emphasize to you the the commonness of this black sooty appearance of a lot of different types of silver ore here's another specimen this is also from the comstock load you see the black mineralization there this is from the Great Bonanza, which is a very famous uh, ore area at Virginia City. It yielded millions of dollars. And in fact, the, uh, the thing that I showed you at the beginning, you know, the introduction where I was standing out in uh, next to the uh, great foundations for the hoist, this is stuff that came out of that mine. Here's some more black and sooty looking silver ore, this time from Tonopah. Now, not everything, um, you know, comes out looking black. Here's more gray and, and that sort of thing. Um, this is, again, right, and another silver mineral called stephanite. Um, but this is also a specimen of rich silver ore from Nevada. Now, one of the things that I should emphasize about silver ore is that silver uh, commonly occurs with lead. And you can see the sparkly gray kind of mineral in this specimen. This is a silver and lead ore. And so um, there's quite a bit of lead. If you pick this up, it would be very heavy and have a lot of weight to it. And you would have a good value that when they mine this kind of ore in Nevada, it had good values in lead and good values in silver as well. And some, some of the ores from the silver lead mines had decent gold and some didn't. But the silver and lead are commonly closely associated together. Here's some more from that same mine. 
with uh, dark colored silver minerals and you can see kind of banding in this one parallel bands of different uh, minerals and that's formed because as the vein uh, the solutions that that formed the vein went through an opening like a fault um, over time the solutions would change in chemistry and so if it changed one way you might get a deposit of quartz and maybe later on it would change and you would get a deposit of mostly um, uh, galena which is a, a lead sulfide and silver with the galena so it kind of goes in in waves as as the material changes in chemistry here is is a a sample of more pure galena you can see the the bright uh, gray metallic it has a, a perfect cleavage and the mineral breaks into a square shape and if you look at this with a microscope you can see the the square breakage um, on the cleavage planes of the galena another sample of galena that I own this is one I picked up this is really about the size of a child's fist but it weighs several pounds because of all the galena in it all the lead but it also has quite a bit of silver so one of the things about recognizing silver ore is to recognize um, when you found lead ore that oftentimes lead goes with silver some more specimens of galena uh, that are from Nevada this is a specimen from the Eureka district and in Eureka they produced huge amounts of lead but also copper and uh, large amounts of silver and gold as well this this silver lead ore contained very significant amounts of gold along with it and this is a large specimen this is probably a 25 30 pound specimen another specimen of rich dark colored silver ore from the Comstock load here's another specimen this looks as you can see a lot different you do see the gray sulfides along there which is silver and other minerals this is from the Calico district in Southern California and at Calico they mined a, a lot of silver and there were some very rich uh, types of, of silver ore there and you can see the little bit on the right hand side the the green greenish kind of color and and that actually is a silver chloride that's your chlorargyrite and then the gray is the silver sulfides so in this specimen you both have have both the oxidized and the reduced uh, which is the sulfide version so there's a, a quite a difference between oxidized ores these are mean this means ores that have weathered at the surface and changed from their original makeup to a more you know, let's say um, a more oxidized they basically they've been weathered and and so the silver can actually form some interesting concentrations when it weathers the the minerals as they get dissolved tend to move down the veins and reconcentrate and redeposit so you often have silver outcrops that where the outcrop may be near barren but you might go down 20 feet and it might be super rich and you might go down 100 feet and you go from super rich to low grade there's a lot of mines throughout the west especially in the more desert areas of uh, california nevada and arizona where there were silver deposits that the miners found and as they worked it down when they got from this oxidized level down to the um, to the level where they hit the original sulfides the grade greatly decreased and the mine could no longer pay to operate okay so we've looked at silver in combination with sulfur in various forms and and that sooty black material that that commonly is is what they find with silver or remember when we talked about the the nasty blue black material well a lot of it was that silver sulfide uh, it used to be called argentite but they now call it a canthite different change of mineral name but uh, 
Now you've seen what that looks like. So now let's take a look at what they call oxidized silver ores. So this is ores that um, basically form when the, uh, the veins or deposits are near the surface and the force of water and air act on the minerals and change their nature. So we're gonna see what oxide silver ores look like now. Here's some oxidized ore. This is from the rich silver district of Austin, Nevada. And you can see it's oxidized, it's rusted. All the iron is in form of rust. You don't see the little sulfide crystals and minerals. And in specimens like this, oftentimes the silver doesn't really look like anything. This ore actually has real high grades of silver, but it doesn't really look like much. You can't see any black sooty sulfides. You can't see anything that looks great at all, just some kind of rustiness in the vein. But yet it has good silver ore. Here's a specimen of ore from Rochester, Nevada. And again, it just doesn't look like much of anything. But the ore carries a good grade. It's oxidized, it's rusty, it, it doesn't look like much. But uh, when the miners finally assayed this, uh, they found that it was a pretty good grade. And actually, the Rochester area had been known for years and years, and nobody ever took it to get a formal fire assay done. And it wasn't until after the turn of the century that they discovered that, hey, this kind of bland-looking quartz, it's, it's got some good silver values. Here is a, an example of oxidized quartz, rusty, uh, silver-bearing quartz from Tonopah. And this kind of stuff, again, was ignored for years. And finally, when somebody paid to have it assayed and tested, surprise, it comes back really good grade in silver. So, you know, not all silver ores really look like much. Here's another ore that doesn't look like much. This was from a mine that was actually uh, worked in the 1980s um, by Sunshine Mining. It was in Nevada. It was called the 16 to 1 mine. And this is a specimen of their ore. Doesn't look like much, but again, it has good values in gold and silver. The only way to really test a no is by going in and having assays done. Because if you just look at it, it doesn't look like much. Again, another uh, specimen of ore that doesn't look like much, but is very rich it has silver chloride and if you look really close there's some small wires of what are uh, native silver um, again uh, a form more common than the really unusual fantastic shapes we looked at earlier is just the little wires of, of native silver within an oxidized ore Here's um, some serargerite. This is uh, silver chloride that's formed by the weathering and oxidation of a vein. Uh, at the, the Divide Mine near Tonopah, they actually hit a rich pocket of this in the early 1920s that kept the mine going for quite a long time. It was fantastically rich. Uh, it was, you know, probably a third or half silver by weight, and this is a specimen of that material. Here's another specimen of that chlorargyrite. Um, basically, the gray on the left is the silver mineral. The white on the on the right is cerussite. It's a uh, a lead mineral. And so I I told you about how the silver associates with the lead, and and um, they often are found together. Well, this is what happens after weathering. The Silver doesn't go in with the serargerite like it does with the galena. They kind of separate, and so you get two minerals. You get a silver chloride, and you get a, a lead carbonate, and this is the result. Um, here's some more real oxidized ore, although this shows the, the black. The black in this is probably almost certainly manganese, not, uh, not silver. And, but the, still, the, the grade was really good because uh, in the early days, this had $800 worth of silver and $700 worth of gold from the Tonopah Belmont mine. 
Here's another ore specimen, oxidized ore specimen from Tonopah. And in it, you can see little lines of blue. And if you look even harder, you can see some green. Um, this is basically the copper that was associated with this. When the copper oxidized, again, it went its own way, separate from the gold and silver. And you get these little cracks filled with blue copper minerals. So I had mentioned that silver was commonly associated with lead. Well, and that is absolutely the case and nothing different about that. But there are also cases where it's associated with copper. And here is uh, an ore called tetrahedrite, which is a common ore of antimony and uh, copper, but that does almost always contain significant amounts of silver and in this specimen actually the pretty green stuff that you see is copper that's a mineral called malachite and kind of in the back of the specimen you may see some gray material and that gray material is actually the unoxidized tetrahedrite because uh, tetrahedrite is um, you know an important ore of copper in places but it also is an important ore of silver so in addition to sometimes silver being closely associated with lead it's also closely associated sometimes not always sometimes with copper here is another specimen of copper silver ore this time from uh, the bristol district in lincoln county nevada that's out in the eastern part of nevada out toward toward the utah border and you can see the blue and a green uh, copper minerals in this specimen pretty plainly but there also is important amounts of silver with it as well so again uh, sometimes when you find significant uh, veins with silver or with copper in it uh, you'll find a significant uh, silver values associated with the copper as well now I mentioned that lead is commonly associated with silver and when it oxidizes oftentimes the uh, lead and silver will separate that you get chlorargyrite with the silver and sericite with the, the lead this is a, an oxidized lead antimony mineral that has significant silver in it this is called bindhemite and it's from central nevada from uh, the candelaria district it's a sample uh, this shows that the, the splotches of dark brown are uh, remnants of what were pyrite and then the yellow and green is remnants of a uh, mineral that was called uh, that's called jamesonite and it alters to produce this usually yellow but sometimes greenish waxy kind of mineral and it has very significant silver and and this specimen actually has significant gold values as well here's another uh, example of silver rich bindhemite from uh, the Good Springs district in Clark County down in the southern part of Nevada but you can see the yellow and the earthy tones and then the um, the rusty you know, brown colors that are typical associated with iron oxides but the yellow is the bindhemite and it uh, it is an important ore in places of silver and it's commonly because the the jamesonite which it forms from is often silver rich now nevada was once famous as silver land and uh, produced huge amounts of silver and in this day of modern gigantic open pit mines nevada still produces some very significant silver and this is in fact the biggest silver mine in the state of nevada and you can see it's quite huge it's been operating for a couple of decades more than 20 years and produces millions and millions of ounces of silver each year this mineralized rust colored rock a lot of it is ore and uh, they take it and do what they call heap leaching on it they sprinkle a very dilute solution of cyanide which then dissolves the silver and and also dissolves the tiny bit of gold that's associated with the silver and they collect that and extract the silver and gold out of it um, for sale and refining so this has been a review of silver ores and 
how to recognize them and what some examples look like. And I hope when you're out in the field at a silver mine uh, or a place known to produce silver that you'll keep your eyes out and maybe you'll see some interesting specimens that look like the ones you've just seen that may help you find some good ore in the future. Okay, well we've had a chance to look at a whole lot of different kinds of silver ores. From native natural silver in weird strange shapes, to um, sulfide silver ores, to oxidized ores, to some ores that were super high grade, to ores that are you know pretty moderate and not really that great, but still pretty good. I mean, even the moderate stuff isn't too bad. So you've gotten a chance to see a whole lot of examples of silver ores from around the world in different types and different natures. And so I hope that you'll find this video useful. You know, the bottom line with silver ores, if you have any question or any doubt, I think I mentioned that, uh, you know, not every sooty black mineral is a silver ore. It's just that a lot of silver ores do have sooty black minerals. The only way to find out for sure is how they did here at Virginia City when the guy took the sample and ran it by assay. So an assay is a chemical process where a sample of rock or ore is crushed and the gold and silver extracted and measured. This is part of an assay setup and the cups that look like they have melted stuff on them uh, are uh, the crucibles that contain the crushed ore mixed with chemicals and then you see the thing with the black door that's an oven uh, the extraction process is basically a, a fusion type of process now I know that many of you may have a, a lot of comments and questions about silver ores um, I want you to know that uh, I'll be happy to do my best to answer them and feel free to comment and ask questions because I do take a look at them and I do do my best to answer them. So I appreciate that. And So now that you know a little bit more about silver ores, you may want to learn to be a better prospector as a whole, to go out and find your own gold, find your own minerals, silver included. And I wrote a book about prospecting and it's called Fistful of Gold. And I'd like to tell you a little bit more about it right now. Okay, so I wanted to tell you a little bit more about my book. Um, I wanted to be able to share the knowledge that I've gained about finding gold and, and how to be successful. And so I spent years literally writing this book, Fistful of Gold. It's more than 350 pages long, which is why I say it's an encyclopedia of everything you need to know about finding your own gold. Um, I've sold more than 8,000 copies and I've got a lot of really great feedback on it. It just is the most complete book on the market. It has information about finding gold that literally is not available in any other book that you're going to find for prospectors because I took technical stuff from geologists and other um, mineral scientists and I've translated that into language that the average guy can understand. You don't need a PhD to go out and find gold. But the information that scientists have learned over recent decades can can be of a lot of help to people. So it's in this book. Uh, if you're interested about finding gold, panning, sluicing, nugget detecting, uh, dry washing, the geology of gold deposits and how they form, it's all in here. And like I say, it's more than 350 pages long. So if you'll just go to the description underneath this video, um, you can take a look. I've got a link in there to take you to Amazon to the site where the book is sold. And I think you'll you'll really enjoy it. Take, take a look at all the people who've commented on this and have really liked the book. It has a, a very, very high rating for a book. And also, I have a, a website, my own free website that uh, you can take a look at. Um, I've got all kinds of information on here about uh, doing research and how to find gold, a lot of good information, stuff that basically uh, couldn't fit into my book. And so I put it on this website and I have a, a link also for that in the video description. So take a look in the description and you can click on the, uh, the link and it'll take you to my website. And finally, 
If you like this presentation, I've got a lot more coming out. Here's a three and a half ounces of gold that I found a couple years back in one area. Um, I've got a lot more of these videos coming on gold, gemstones, hard rock, placer, a lot of metal detecting. There'll be lots of metal detecting stuff. So if you really enjoyed this, click the subscribe button and then tick the notification bell off and YouTube will let you know when I publish new stuff. And hit the like button as well. And please comment on these videos because I'm interested in what you have to say. And I promise to answer any questions you have. So if you are wondering about anything or think maybe I didn't cover something thoroughly enough in a video, then let me know and I'll be happy to try and help you out and give you whatever information you need. So thanks a lot and um, hope you enjoyed this and we'll see you again real soon.